Real people, real breakthroughs. This is the Psychology of Eating podcast, where psychology and nutrition meet to uncover the true causes of our unwanted eating concerns. Your relationship with food will never be the same. Now, here's your host, eating psychology expert and founder of the Institute for the Psychology of Eating, Mark David. Welcome everybody, I'm Mark David, founder of the Institute for the Psychology of Eating, and here we are back in the Psychology of Eating podcast, and I'm with Megan today. Welcome, Megan. It's good to be here. I'm glad you're here, and Megan, let me just fill in people for a moment who may be new to the podcast. So here's how this goes. Megan and I just met. We've been chit-chatting for a few minutes before we hopped on here, and we're going to see if we can do some good work in less than an hour and move the needle and, you know, figure out what would best serve you, Miss Megan. So here's my question for you. If you could wave your magic wand and get whatever you wanted to get out of this session, what would that be for you? It would be more clarity on how to... Really, I want to have clarity of not feeling bad about wanting to compete in bodybuilding shows, but also, like, just clarity of what I want, I suppose, in my relationship with my body. Mm -hmm. So, what's unclear for you? So, ever since I've started the eating psychology course, and even before that, um... I noticed that my current diet, my current lifestyle weren't really serving me to my best ability. My company is all about teach people about self-love and self-acceptance and it seemed so counterproductive of what I was trying to do and then I just felt stuck as a coach and then I didn't. It's been hard for me to come to the terms of do I have to give up doing bodybuilding shows in order to really realistically reach this goal of loving myself and accepting myself. And it's this weird combination of like, of like loving yourself and accepting yourself, yet it being okay to continually progress forward. Mm -hmm. So. So if you were clear, let's say you were clear, just give me a sense what what that might look like or feel like. I wouldn't struggle, so I wouldn't feel shame and guilt when it comes to wanting to compete in a show. I wouldn't. I wouldn't feel like I'm stuck in this like halfway wanting to reach a new goal, but then also like. Like, I'm fine with my body right now. I love it. It's great. The amount of stress where I don't have to worry about food right now is fabulous. Like, I'm not constantly thinking about food. I don't have to weigh and track my food. And that's so nice. And I love that. But then there's this part of me that's like, well, you know, I'm a fitness coach. I teach people, you know, how to be better with themselves and reach self It's That's what the line is. It's between, like... I started out being a personal trainer and fitness coach and now I'm shifting more into like self-acceptance and I'm trying to like figure out where that meets in the middle and ultimately I feel like I'm trying to teach what I'm also trying to find and it causes a lot of like feeling like I'm going nowhere sometimes. Mm-hmm. I hear you. So how old are you? I'm 24. 24. So how long have you been doing sort of the fitness thing? Um, I started, so I started competing three, four years ago, and I've been like doing personal training and stuff like that for about five now. Mm -hmm. What inspired you to start? What inspired me to start was I had seen, so I was training all these people, they were generally overweight, And, you know, I was educating them to be better with their food choices and work out and change their habits to be more consistent so they could reach their goals. But then I had realized I had never gone through a goal myself. And so then I was like, well, I'm going to do a bodybuilding show because I was never really overweight. But, you know, it was like, I'm going to take it to that next level. Mm -hmm. Plus, it was always great for marketing. So... 
to say that you're doing such competitions kind of thing? Well, I would just say it's, I've struggled with the fact that it's, um, you know, people are, people are going to believe what you tell them to do if you look a certain part. And that's definitely been a controlling factor of why I tended to do them. Mm -hmm. And now it's more so I'm doing it because I don't, I don't know. I don't know. My last show prep was awful. It was like the worst. I started like binging, not really binging, just overeating on what my macronutrient allotment was for the day, basically because I was on like a starvation diet for three months. I wasn't eating more than 30 grams of carbs, and that's really unrealistic. Mm -hmm. Technically, I was eating more than that because I was going over all the time, and that just led to shame, and that shame led to more shame, mm -hmm. and then that led to over-exercising, and then... And then I decided that actually it was okay though because it kind of propelled me into shifting more into this like self-acceptance and mindful eating versus if it fits your macros and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So are you, so when you're training, are you working with like a coach or a nutritionist kind of thing? Or are you just kind of doing it on your own? I was at the time working with a coach. My first shows I was working with, um, my ex-boyfriend at the time, well, my boyfriend at the time, and uh, I think a lot of how perfect I had to be on my diet was because I wanted to be his best client, and it kind of fed that cycle of, I don't know if I was really competing in shows for myself, I think I was more so doing it because I, I wanted to make him proud in a weird way. Mm -hmm. And then once that relationship was over, then I was like, well, I need to do a show now so that I can prove to myself that I can do it. And that's when I started shifting more into like, not, not binging, just overeating, I would say. Sometimes binging, but emotional eating is what I'm pretty sure that it is. It's just emotional eating and going over. Mm -hmm. But then I started working with another coach, and that was good because it almost gave me this, like, excuse that if it doesn't work out and I don't place first, then it's not all on me. And so then I did a show, and I looked the best I had ever looked, and then I was like, okay, I'm going to go for nationals because I wanted to get my pro card. And that show prep was just horrendous because I was going through a lot in life, like, I was moving out of my old roommate situation who it was just a, not a good environment. I had gotten a place off of Craigslist, but I really didn't want to stay in Vegas for more than like a month. I ended up getting all my money stolen from me from this girl that wasn't paying rent. I like moved in, an eviction notice was on the door. Next thing you know, like 24 hours later, I'm like going to Washington to live in this other place where I could get where I didn't have to sign a lease. And it was just hard not to emotionally eat. Mm -hmm. No, just hearing that, I want to eat. And I, didn't <laughs> even go, I didn't even go through it. Yeah. So, so, let me ask you this question. Let's just jump ahead for a second. Where do you see yourself like six, seven years from now? Where would you like to be in your life? Um, I would like to be a lot more stable. I really like traveling, but I would like to have a place where I can just, you know, it feels like my home. I think I went through, a, it's been an entire process like this. Like I went from living with my boyfriend to we were renting from his mom. And so whenever we got in an argument, it was like, you're the one to go. And then from there, it was like, I was in this other living situation that wasn't very good to this other living situation that I couldn't stay out for a long period of time. I would like to have a place that would be like my own, but a lifestyle that would still allow me to travel and that's why I do all, all like online coaching and it's nice That's why I like partially I'm doing this program just so I can kind of see what you guys do on the back end and your mm -hmm. schedule of when you come out with things and everything like that so I would like to be more stable I would like to be traveling I would like to be inspiring people I have this goal to help inspire six million women to finding self-love and acceptance and ending this crazy cycle of gaining weight to drop weight to gain weight to drop weight 
and just all around be unhappy. Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. Good for you. That's a nice big vision for yourself. Thanks. Yeah. So I'd love to share some thoughts with you so far in terms of like what, what we've been talking about, questions I've been answering, answers you've been giving. Um, you know, early 20s are a time, I think, when we are naturally unstable on a lot of levels. Um, there's a lot of shifting. There's a lot of changing. On the one hand, you're not a teenager anymore. On another hand, you're not an established adult. You're this weird hybrid. <laughs> you're you're kind of in between worlds right now. And usually when we're in transition and we're in between worlds, um, it's, it's just tricky territory because there's not a lot of stability and there's not a lot of familiarity and things are changing quickly and things are uncertain and are unclear. So all I'm trying to say is if things seem uncertain, unclear and unstable, you're in the right place. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. So you're, you're on point for this stage of life where you're at. If we state it in the positive, what I want to say to you is you're in a discovery zone. You're trying out different things. And you're seeing what works, what sticks, what do I like, what don't I like. Oh, here's a direction I want to move in. How do I move in that direction? Huh, let me try this. This might work. Whoops, that wasn't good. Let me try this way. So there's a lot of, a lot of trial and error going down. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is good for you because it's strengthening your trial and error muscles. Talk about a fitness competition. This is you learning how to be, I think, more fit with life. Um, so all I'm saying is if you're not where you want to be, that's fine because it's, it's, it's probably too early in the game right now. Um, so from that place... In terms of you saying like, okay, there's this little bit maybe of guilt around wanting to coach people around self-love, but here you are doing fitness competitions and kind of pushing it to another level. And those are intense competitions and it's intense preparation and it's some weird dieting that you have to do. Um, so it's very extreme. And I hear you asking the question like, how does all this mix in together? And so I'd love to offer some possible answers that I think are all correct, even though they all might sound different. Um, I think there's a level where it's absolutely fine for you to do what you want to do and explore, you know, one thing that we do when we're young or even not so young is we explore, like, what can I do with this body? You know, how many miles can I run? How many... How long can I bike? Can I win this race? Can I lift this amount of weight? Can I look like this? Can I feel strong like that? That's totally legitimate. You're, you're just exploring your own biology. You're exploring your own potential and learning what that means for you. So to me, I think you're gathering information and you're learning about yourself. So you have to decide as you're doing the next competition, like, Okay, how's this working for me? Am I okay with this diet? Am I okay with the extremeness of it? When you tell me you go on, you're, you're prepping for a competition and you say, well, I'm emotionally eating, the carbs, this, that. Let me tell you something. I know, I, I've seldom met a person who, and I meet a lot of people in this realm, who are training for competitions, being on intense diets, and this is the common story. They're always binge eating. They're always breaking the rules because it's a virtually impossible to follow diet. Yeah. And you have to push yourself so hard to not deviate. And then when you deviate, you think there's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. That's like, you know, me, me pushing your head underwater and saying, well, how come you can't stay under there for 10 minutes? Like, what's your issue? It's like biology won't let you stay there that long. Yeah. You've only got about a minute, a minute and a half till you want some air. Um, 
So I'm just hoping if you do continue with competitive, you know, fitness kind of stuff, that you be a little gentler on yourself around the dieting piece and the places where you fall off the wagon because it's virtually impossible. It's so hard, especially you have your life to deal with. And if you're feeling lonely or emotional or bored or whatever, we like to turn to food. Mm -hmm. But in the process, you're kind of starving anyway. So you probably wish you had more food either way, even if life was perfect. Yeah. You follow me? Yeah. So I'm just really wanting you to give yourself a little more space to be an explorer here. Okay. To gather more information, to learn, to see what works for you, and to let go of the judgment and embrace the good in what you're doing. So when I say let go of the judgment, embrace the good in what you're doing, like what do you feel is the good in competition? Like how does that help you as a person? How does it help you grow as a person? Uh, well, I think that there's a lot of positives that come from setting a goal and reaching it. And mm -hmm. that's one that takes an extended period of time. And it, it also... Um, it allows me to better help my clients, I think, from a per certain perspective, just for like possible insights of, you know, different types of food that they could eat to overcome feeling hungry or um, just a different insight that I think if I had never gone to that level of extreme, I wouldn't have that type of insight. And so that's nice. And also one thing that'll help, like if I get my pro card this year, what I really love doing is teaching posing. It's like the art of illusion and just having that credibility of being like a IFBB bikini pro will give me enough credibility for people to want that service from me. And that's something that I would just like really love to teach that I think would really satisfy me and make me happy. And I would love it. Yeah. So. So I say go for it. Like, like, why not go for it and learn along the way? And, you know, I, I would say this, you're in tricky territory. And when I say you're in tricky territory, and I, and I think you know this, and you've kind of said this in your own words, it's like this is a field, this is a universe, this kind of competition is a place where it's very easy to become perfectionist. It's very easy to become overly obsessive and compulsive. It's very easy to slip into eating behaviors that don't work for you. It's easy to slip into mind thoughts mm -hmm. and um, beliefs about yourself that don't serve you. Yeah. It's easy to be in a world where women are not always supporting each other. You know, this could be a supportive profession, and a lot of times it's very competitive, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, where it's easy for women to hate on each other or men and women to hate on each other for their successes, you yeah. know? Um, so, so you're in a place that's naturally a little tricky, and all I'm saying is just know that. Just be aware of that and see, okay, how do I survive in all that and how do I even thrive in that how do I still maintain my sense of dignity if I don't come in first second third or 23rd you know how do I still love myself in this process how much are you investing in it in what it means about your self-worth um, those are the things I want you to keep an eye on so that at the end of the day you're able to maintain your dignity and you're able to keep loving yourself no matter what. And that you remember somewhere in the back of your mind that your looks and your beauty and your physique don't define you. And it's something you happen to be involved in and, and working with and exploring and playing with. And that's a cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Right? Like it. Yeah. So... Yeah. 
it's your prerogative and it's your choice and it's a fascinating choice and it's a cool thing and I, I would love to see you empower yourself in this process and not second guess your choice mm -hmm. but you can constantly be checking in with yourself to see okay how am I doing, Megan? Like, how am I doing? How does this feel? How is this working out? Where's my head at? Am I getting the real support that I need right now? Am I falling into some bad rabbit hole? That's what I'm interested in you looking out for, is, is to make sure that you just keep maturing as a person and not just getting better as a fitness model. Yeah. Yeah. Make Agreed. sense? Yeah, it does make sense. It does. Mm -hmm. It does. I think I struggle right now. Like right now, I'm not logging my food. And I still eat pretty mindfully. Like I, I try and not have anything else going when I'm eating. I try and focus on eating. I, it, it takes a while after you do a show to become more in tune with like your hunger and signals and things like that because your hormones have to get back to normal. But, um, Plus, you're constantly hungry before, and now you're like, whoa, what is being full? You know, the dieter's mentality. But um, sometimes I feel guilty about not logging my food just for the simple fact that I wonder if I'm... Because in the off-season, I feel like the main goal is to see how much food you can stuff inside yourself and not gain an excess amount of body fat. And it's like, if I'm not logging my food, how do I know if I'm like working my metabolic capacity up to how fast it can be working? Mm -hmm. And sometimes I feel guilty about that. Mm -hmm. So what's your choices there? <laughs> well, I guess my choices are either I have to log my food, which is going to make me obsessive and not to be the break that I need or I kind of have found a little bit of a balance like I'll, I'll make sure that I'm getting you know I can roughly eyeball food by now I don't have to excessively weigh it too much but I try and make sure that I'm getting enough protein within each meal to just make sure that I'm at least hitting my protein. And then other than that, I try and just be mindful about whatever's going on in my life. Like for example, I've been traveling a lot lately. So when I'm home, I try and cook all my meals and um, you know hit my protein but be on the lower end of calories. And then when I'm out and I'm traveling, then I still try and get protein in every meal. But I'm not too worried about calories at that point. Mm -hmm. Got it. So it sounds to me like you found a little bit of a sweet spot. Um, you mentioned, you know, wow, if I'm really doing this rigorously, um, you might get a little obsessive. Um, so it sounds like that's the dangerous territory for you, which makes perfect sense to me. Um, so, yeah, if you're not playing by the rules perfectly, but you are taking care of yourself and preventing you from falling into a bad place that could trigger an unhealthy relationship with food, personally, I'm all for you taking care of yourself. And then you're going to have to learn how to, in your own system, regulate the guilt, meaning you notice it, and you don't let it consume you because you're making a choice. So, you know, you know, this is really all, all I'm talking about right now is just one of the aspects of self mastery, which is if you choose something consciously, you choose to do something, then the repercussions of that choice, we need to on, on a certain level, welcome them to embrace them, to grapple with them, as opposed to going, oh my God, I made this choice, but now look what happened. Now I'm feeling guilty. Wow, let me get sucked into guilt for the next day. Um, and you've sabotaged yourself simply because you didn't stand by your own choice. So the choice was, yeah, I'm not going to weigh and count calories and everything super specific, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this you know, little method that I have found. And even if I feel a little guilty here and there, and even if I don't know 100% about my metabolic potential, you know something, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it because I'm yeah. taking care of myself. So it's sort of, I think it's about trusting your choices. It's, trust, it's learning to trust yourself and stand by your own choices. Yeah. Okay, I agree with that. Does that make sense for you? Oh yeah, it does. It does. Def it definitely does. I think that I've been uh, I've been getting better at that. Sometimes it's just difficult. Like when I imagine that I'm going to start prepping again, that's when I like just have to believe that it's okay that I've been doing it the way I've been doing it. And honestly, I actually know in my mind that it's better the way I've been doing it because I know if I was logging that it would just be very unrealistic with how much I've been traveling and that would just lead to like more shame and mm -hmm. guilt because I wouldn't be able to do it. So it's very like, I'm okay with what I've been doing. Like it works. My weight's been relatively like stable, um, which is nice. Uh, I'm okay with it. It's realistic. It's the best thing that I can be doing right now. And mm -hmm. I know that. Mm -hmm. I know that. I just also know that when I start prepping for my show again here in like a couple months, that I'm just going to also have to be okay with that decision. So I'm okay with it right now. I just realized that in two months I'm going to have to be okay with that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to have to be okay with not knowing what my, my caloric intake is and my macronutrients have been starting this in order to like have a point to work from. Mm -hmm. Which will be fine. It'll be good. It'll be fine. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask you another question. If you were sitting in my seat right now, you were sitting here looking out. I'm actually in California at Laguna Beach. So if you were sitting here talking to a cool young lady like yourself who was presenting this exact same issue, and you happen to know a few things because you've been down this road a little bit. So you're sitting in my seat what else, if anything, or what, what would you be saying to this um, Megan lookalike who has this very interesting and similar challenge to what you faced before? What would you say to her from your standpoint of being a coach? I would tell her that consistency is the best option always. And whatever diet she feels like she can be consistent with is the best diet. And that she should actually be proud of herself for the fact that she's no longer having obsessive thoughts or overeating or feeling any of the guilt associated with that. And that it's okay and it's kind of all part of the cycle of competing and not competing and... And whatever you need to do in order to get your mindset right is probably the best option. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty good advice. Yeah. So let's just break that down a little bit more. The last thing you said I, I, I found pretty interesting. Whatever you need to do to get your mindset right is the best option. So what would that mean for you? What are some things you need to do to get your mindset right? Like what does that mean? get my mindset right um my mindset right now is the best that it's been in a very long time I well what I mean by that is just being aware of how you feel about certain things so like when I'm logging my food I get obsessive and I tend to not feel very good about any situation like I fear going out I I regret going out when I do go out, especially if it wasn't as fun as I thought it was going to be. I emotionally eat. I can't handle my emotions very well. So for me, what's been best, just finding what works, has been a combination of just being a little more lenient with my diet, being a little more flexible, um, you know, working on like journaling and handling my emotions and feeling my emotions versus like eating when I'm experiencing emotions that I don't want to deal with and acceptance. Acceptance has been definitely key, like being non-judgmental 
towards things that are happening has been key. Mm -hmm. Like today, I caught myself mindlessly eating. I don't feel bad about it right now, but I caught myself mindlessly eating. Mm -hmm. So, what are some of the challenging emotions that kind of cause you to want to eat? Definitely when I feel lonely, mm -hmm. kind of when life starts to get, like, I just feel like nothing's very stable, like, food's always been there. Um, there's certain things about myself that I don't think that, that they're hard for me to look at non-judgmentally and accept and love what is, and so when I'm experiencing things like that, sometimes it's easier to eat than actually, like, sit with my feelings. And um, I, I went through a lot of emotional eating when I got out of my, like, previous relationship, which was, like, a little over a year ago. Um, that's when I noticed I was emotionally eating a lot. And I was emotionally eating in secret all the time. Um, then this last show prep, I was also eating in secret a lot as well. And I think that that was just because of... I, d I just would feel lonely and unstable and then I would eat and it would feel better and mm -hmm. and then it wouldn't feel better and then it would just continue. Understood. Understood. You know, again, I want to remind you that given your situation, the stage of life you're at, the fact that you're pretty much out there on your own in living in a place where you don't know a lot of people, and where it would be easy to be lonely because you don't have, you know, a support system where you are. Like, that's hard. That's yeah. hard. That's hard. Plus, you're engaging in a very specific and intense kind of training and competition. Um, so I'm just saying give yourself a little space to, you know, be imperfect here because... You're doing something that's not easy at all, and you don't have necessarily a lot of easy ways to distract yourself or to medicate and feel good. You know what I'm saying? So, so food's going to be natural for that, and your task is to learn how to still nurture yourself with food and take care of yourself with food and nourish yourself but not overdo it so you're not liking yourself and also to understand that if you do emotionally eat or you do overeat it makes perfect sense yeah and then the question is how fast can you forgive yourself and move forward as opposed to kick yourself when you're down and not move forward so that's the key and that's the key is shortening the time and this is a training. This is you, you train yourself from now until the day you die, shortening the time between when we fall off the wagon, any wagon, and when we get back on again. Falling off the wagon could be, I love myself, and all of a sudden I'm hating myself. So you're going to hate yourself for two years, two months, two weeks, two days, two hours, two minutes. The more we shorten it, the less time we are in misery. <laughs> Plain and simple. And yeah. we have that say. It's just, it's... It's a training. It's like everything else. It's like watching your macronutrients. It's like getting taking in a certain amount of calories or protein. It's like you're just regulating how long we stay on the mat kicking ourselves. Mm -hmm. So so what you thinking? What are your thoughts right now? Where are you at? Hold on. Um, my thoughts. Gosh, hold on. Everything's buzzing right now. Okay. It makes sense. I feel like I've been slowly going through all of this and experiencing it and uh, realizing that I need to be more gentle with myself. I'm definitely like a perfectionist and I, I just, I'm very... I have high expectations for myself, and so sometimes when I don't meet those, I'm not very kind to myself. 
but um, it's definitely been better, like a lot better than it used to be. Mm-hmm. And I've just become a lot more aware of it. There's also things that I don't know that I have answers to. Like as far as like a weight number is concerned, I, I've never been like afraid of the scale. But so I've been, I weighed myself just the other day because I, I moved into this place like yesterday. And um, I was like unpacking it. And for a while I'd put my scale away and I wasn't weighing myself because it just didn't matter, you know? I don't need to weigh myself, I can just feel how I feel about myself and just be aware of how I feel. But uh, I weighed myself and I weighed 120. And I haven't weighed that much in probably three years. And so it was kind of weird, like I was thinking about it for a while and although I feel good, like yeah, there's some days where I'm like, you know, I feel a little bloated right now, I don't feel good, like I try and just like take it as it comes, but um, I started thinking about how I would feel if my weight got up to like 125 and I was like, I would not be okay with that, 125 is like the cutoff. And I know that's still unrealistic in my head. For one, like I've been maintaining around the 115 to 120 mark for the last three months. And then before that, I was like just coming off of show prep. So when I do show, I'm down to 100 pounds. And within, you know, four or five months, I gained 20 pounds. And so it's kind of just a shock. Anyone would go through a shock. Like if anyone dropped that much weight, it would be, you know, a different, they'd have to go through certain mental aspects and dealing with it and handling it but and I don't really have to worry about my weight gaining because honestly when I'm eating mindfully and just eating without freaking out about it all I I average that weight and the only way my weight would probably go up is if I gained muscle but I had to really think about it I was like I don't consider myself to be afraid of a number on the scale but when I think about if I were like five pounds heavier with like fat on me I couldn't do it I don't think I could ever get my body to that point mm-hmm I don't know yeah yeah you're in you're in you're in dangerous territory and the dangerous territory again is called the kind of fitness competition that has the body looking so specific, has us eating so specific, exercising so specific, working out so specific, everything is so regimented. Um, And people don't live there all the time because it's impossible to sustain. And what happens also is people get high. I've seen this about a gazillion times. Um, You get high running a marathon. You can get high running a 100-yard dash. You can get high training for a fitness model competition, and there you are, and you, you're at 100 pounds or whatever it is, and for a lot of people, it's a high. Yeah. And we think that that's the new benchmark. We think that's where we should live, which is like saying, you know, I did drugs and I should live there because it felt so good. Um, it's a temporary experience. So I'm just saying that so you remember that in the back of your mind. So when you get sucked into thinking that that's where you should live, Mm -hmm. to remember that no one lives there. And I promise you, if you meet someone who lives there, that's all they do. They are spending their entire life in obsession and in a very strange kind of living hell that yeah, might look exactly. good on the outside. I don't want to be there. I'm okay with not maintaining it. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't take as many pictures, flexing photos, but I'm okay with not maintaining that. Mm-hmm. Damn. The level of obsession that comes with it is such a... It's a different trade-off, but mm-hmm. it's... I like it. I like right now. Right now it's good. Yeah. It's teaching yeah. you. You're learning from it, and that's this... Again, that's the stage in your life that you're in, you know, early, mid-20s is definitely a time for you to be exploring, is definitely a time for you to be pushing your edges in the ways you want to push them, learning about yourself, what do you like, what don't you like, 
where are your gifts? Where are the places that, you know, you need to work on? It's, it's, it's you're in that kind of territory, and it's completely fair game. You don't have to know. And I, again, I hope you ongoingly give yourself space to be in this phase of life where you don't know and there's not going to be a lot of answers. And I get that you, you're going to want stability. That makes total sense. Mm -hmm. And that'll come. That will come in time. But it's not going to come today or tomorrow. You know, you still got to ride the bucking bronco a little bit. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. I don't mind it. What else, Miss Megan? What else is on your mind? Um, I don't know. I think sometimes I wonder how when, like right now I'm not super obsessive, but when I am like logging my food and logging my macros and weighing everything, is there any way that I can... Like, I, I, I know that I can be more gentle with myself and realize that it's going to be you know, a day by day process and accept it and not give myself so much guilt when it does happen. But, um, are there any like ways to not obsess about food so much? Would you say like, do you think that there is like a good balance between having food? So one thing I noticed my last show prep, well, not my last one, but my one before that, when I had like a stable living situation during that, it was so much easier when I would have certain food, like just not made into meals, but it would be kind of like the vegetables would be chopped, like certain meat would be cooked. And I, I ate very similar during certain meals. It was never like I had to eat that, mm -hmm. but I ate kind of similar. And I think it led to me not obsessing over so much over food, whereas the other show prep that I did, I didn't have anything prepped because my life was so crazy. And I was obsessing over food a lot more because there were so many choices. Sure, sure. So clearly from what you're telling me, predictability is helpful for you in this process. A little bit more of a system around food is helpful so you're not left in the unknown of, okay, what am I going to eat? How is this prep? When it's already prepped, you know what it's going to be. You know how much. When there's that kind of regularity then that sounds like it takes away a big unknown for you. So that's something to consider. It's something to play with. Um, okay. Creating structure for yourself, um, especially this time in life, whatever structure you can create that makes sense is good, given all the instability you're going to have anyway, being a 24-year-old. Okay. You follow me? So whatever stability works, okay, I'm, I'm prepping Let's plan the meals as best I can. Whatever supports you in doing that, see if that works. Give it a try. And when you do obsess, when you do obsess, instead of stop, instead of trying to stop obsessing, yeah. oftentimes I find a more useful approach is to notice yourself obsessing, mm -hmm. observe yourself obsessing, give yourself permission to obsess, and even say to yourself, this is me obsessing right now. And the more you can witness it, oftentimes without reacting. Yeah, takes the power away. It takes a little bit of the power away. You learn to control it better because you're not, your first response is not to fight it. Your first response is to allow it and notice it because it's happening anyway. Okay. The moment you start to fight it, you create a fight. And you can't win a fight that's you against you. You are going to lose. Okay. Even though it looks like a part of you wins. So all I'm saying is when you start to obsess, give yourself almost permission to obsess. Great. Okay. This is me obsessing. Let me push the pedal to the metal and see how much I could obsess and see how that feels. Okay. You follow me? Yeah. So it's playing. It's experimenting. It's trying to be a little playful with our, with the strange, quirky ways that humans can have around food and not take it so seriously. Okay. I like that. Yeah. I like it yeah. too. <laughs> Megan, I super appreciate you just kind of being so open and sharing about your process and what you're up to 
and I just think you're super brave for just how you've been conducting yourself in your life and really stepping out on your own, like at a young age. That's super impressive. It's not easy. Um, so I really hope you find the little ways to kind of give yourself a good pat on the back and some con congratulations around that because you're doing something very difficult and hard stepping out on your own and working at something where you're trying to achieve a form of excellence. Um, excellence is good, you know. Learning excellence in one thing will train you to be better at creating excellence in other places. Um, sports taught me that, you know, martial arts, basketball, football, all of it taught me how to be a better person because I let it teach me that, you know. So all I'm saying is this could be the same thing for you. Yeah, it's teaching you uh, about diet and fitness and the body and that sort of thing, but it's also teaching you about being rigorous. It's teaching you how to follow a system. It's teaching you how to push beyond your limits. I think all that's a pretty good thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's teaching me to find self-love in a different way. Agree. Agree, agrees. Good for you. Thanks. Thanks so much for doing this, Megan. Yeah, it's been fun. Thank you. All right. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Once again, I'm Mark David on behalf of the Psychology of Eating podcast. As always, there's lots more to come, my friends. You take care. I hope this was helpful. Thanks for listening to the Psychology of Eating podcast. To learn more about the breakthrough body of work we teach here at the Institute for the Psychology of Eating, please sign up for our free video series at ipe.tips. That's I for institute, P for psychology, E for eating dot tips, T I P S. You'll learn about the cutting edge principles of dynamic eating psychology and mind body nutrition that have helped millions of people forever transform their relationship with food, body, and health.